Uh, so I'm going to talk to you about Annexin Pharmaceuticals, which is a company that I'm the CEO since, since 2019. Um, the company set out to work uh, with a protein called Annexin A5. It's a naturally occurring protein. You have it in yourself, I have it, uh, we all have it. It functions as a protective molecule for various different cells. It, it controls the immune system and inflammatory reactions. We're based in Stockholm, just a few, uh, 10 minutes walk from here. Uh, we're a small company, virtually organized in a way. We have consultants all over the world, but we're a core team of, let's say, six people. Uh, we have decided among the various opportunities for NXNA5 and ANXV uh, to work with in ophthalmology and a relatively limited initiative also in cancer. But our product, NXV, is in an intravenous solution. You can see it in the, in the middle here. It's basically the vial that we currently deliver to the clinics uh, in the US for testing in retinal vein occlusion. And both these programs, retinal vein occlusion and in cancer, have huge opportunities on the market addressing a very novel mechanism that nobody's addressed before. The team, myself, um, MD, PhD from Karolinska, worked with Astra that became AstraZeneca, then in small companies as CEO and CISO, working with international companies and licensing, etc. cetera. Um, Anna Frostegård is our founder and, and innovator. Uh, she's a CISO, CMO. In the company, working with this biology for many, many years. Uh, Susan Satchdev is our COO with experience from Pfizer and clinical research organizations. Uh, Susan Anderson is a relatively newcomer to the company, uh, a CFO with experience from listed companies as well as, as uh, life science companies. And Mario Fsadny, ophthalmologist, worked with Allergan Novartis as clinical developer. And Mario Fsadny, oncologist, uh, working in, in uh, Johnson & Johnson and Regeneron as immune oncology drug developer. So what do we do? What does ANXV do? Uh, the cell is an intact bubble with cell nucleus and DNA and all that in it, and functions, but there's a lipid membrane, basically, like a balloon with a lipid, with a lipid rather than rubber uh, coverage. Uh, this lipid is a double lipid layer. On the inside, uh, there's fossil serine, which is always on the inside. Almost. But when the cell comes, becomes sick, stressed, uh, or actually some l normal cells in diseases, it's PS, that I would call it, is on the outside of the cells. And once PS is on the outside of the cells, it starts to signal things to the environment, including cell cells become sticky, immune cells react to this PS, and so on. And an XNA5 is the body's own way of trying to control what, what PS signals to the outer world. Uh, and as I said, NXV is just a mimic of the naturally occurring protein. Um, eye disease, retinal vein occlusion. So that's a very unknown disease, I would tell you, but it's a big problem. 16 million people around the world suffer from this. I mean, there's 400,000 new patients in the US and, and Europe every year. What happens from the patient's perspective is, you can see that to, to the right, uh, the image, all of a sudden, it becomes, vision comes blurry on one eye, uh, and the patient would seek the doctor. The reason for that is to the, to the left side, which is basically an occlusion in the vein. Every organ needs arterial blood flow with oxygen, there's a flow back from the tissue via the capillaries to the veins leading back to the heart, and the occlusion in the vein basically results in a, a, a stop of the, the back flow uh, to, the, to the heart, and therefore it becomes swelling, you get cell death, you get visually the vision loss that occurs in these patients. It's an obscure disease in the sense that the mechanism of action is not completely well known, but the way to treat it currently is to inject straight into the eye what's called anti-VEGFs. These are antibodies basically reducing the swelling and some formation of blood vessels. But patients have to get it every fourth week, every six weeks, or eight weeks, sometimes for many, many years to come. And that's the option that patients have today. We have a totally different option. We believe that we can treat the patients in maybe five days uh, with one injection a day in the vein, in concert to the heart, to the straight into the eye. We address the cause of the disease. We have anti-inflammatory uh, cell protecting different mechanisms that we work with that the next thing can achieve in these patients, which is totally different from anti-VEGF. So we will definitely introducing a very novel concept to treat this devastating disease. So having gone through phase one in healthy volunteers, we decided to go to the US for the clinical phase 2B trial. 
uh, and that's conducted currently in seven different sites in the, in the US. I decided to do a study in patients that have not yet received anti-VEGF, so they are anti-VEGF naive, and study the effects of five days of infusions uh, in these patients, and then monitor for safety, of course, but also for the vision, how well, how many how far down the different lines of the visual acuity board can the patient see. We look at the vasculature in the eye, we look at the, the way uh, the swelling of the retina changes, hopefully, in these patients, and how many anti-VEGF injections they would eventually need uh, during or after we treat the patients. Um, and it's a very interesting study uh, for us because it was kind of hard to recruit patients which was placebo controlled at the outset. But we learned that patients did not necessarily want to have in getting the risk of having a placebo. They were kind of hesitating because it was an intense protocol. They had to go back to the, to the clinic often. On the bad side. On the good side, uh, doctors told us, well, I've had two patients. I don't know if they're on placebo or active, but when they come back, uh, they, so I gave them one anti-VEGF inj injection right after they left your trial. Then they're, then they're supposed to come back and have repeated anti-VEGFs. But these two patients did not, they came back, but they didn't need anti-VEGFs, which is along the lines we have hypothesized. So that was on the good side. So we decided to have a, an independent evaluation team gather in Seattle this summer to review the data still um, masked. So they didn't know whether the placebo or not and tell us, so what do you see uh, in these patients? during the trial uh, and once they've left the trial and coming back to the doctor. And the conclusions were, well, it's highly unusual that two patients out of five treated would come back and not need anti-VEGF. We pr haven't seen this in these kind of patients. Uh, so you should actually uh, unmask the trial. You should look at, are these patients unactive? And if they are unactive in XV, you should there's a sign of biological effect by the drug. And you should continue the trial, take away placebo, um, you should uh, prolong the follow-up of the patients and redesign the study. And so we did. Uh, and of course, we unmasked the trial and found that these two patients were indeed treated with ANXV. So we were very happy and excited that, that day, of course, and we still are, to be honest. Um, and so we decided to move on. We're currently recruiting the last two patients in the first cohort that receives two milligrams. Uh, we're hopefully soon moving to the four milligram. We'll continue to recruit patients for some time still, uh, up to 10 patients. Uh, this is not powered for, for kind of a certain type of efficacy uh, outcome, but rather to follow and probably hopefully confirm uh, the findings that we already have in this trial. So, of course, this is a key to the company, our major program. Um, and the market, well, it's huge. It's 20 mil coming towards 20 billion US dollars, mainly for the anti-VEGF treatments on these patients, they c since they have to come back and come back. We hypothesize that we can access maybe 150,000 of those 400,000 new coming patients every year in the US and five big, largest European uh, countries. And if we treat them, uh, these patients and have a pricing tag along the lines of currently anti-VEGFs. It's a, it's a huge market. It's, it's, in the, it's in the billion dollar market size opportunity for us. So it's, very, it's a very sizable market opportunity and medical need. Um, we have to talk about phase 2B. We will move into phase 2B potentially with a partner. That's our main goal. Uh, but we have to be able to discuss with the partner how we see the phase 2B. And we feel that we can use an outcome which is, which is relative to the anti-VEGF consumption in these patients. For phase three, we believe we need to go to maybe the, the vision board or the visual acuity board. Uh, but that's a discussion that we will have to have with the FDA and other authorities. Oncology, I will be very brief on oncology. Uh, I would say we couldn't resist moving to oncology based on what we read in the public domain. We didn't do the work others did around the world. Um, you know that cancer is treated with surgery, chemotherapy, um, radiation, and immune oncology has made it another opportunity in treating cancer is by activating immune cells to kill the cancer. That's been shown to be the case for NX and A5. NX and A5 can also be tagged or conjugated to a chemotherapy drug, which, be which will become a precision type of medicine bringing the chemotherapy drug to the cancer cell and cancer and kill it. And that's another opportunity in cancer. And then the diagnostic opportunity, which I will not talk about today. But cancers do express PS 
our target on the outside of the cancer cells. They seem to do that as a strategy to survive. The immune suppress uh, the environment so they can grow and grow and grow and metastasize. Uh, this, was, this was done by work in Johns Hopkins. Uh, it's as effective as current, C, uh, current uh, checkpoint inhibitors in this field. Um, I won't go into that detail, but these, these drugs, checkpoint inhibitors, are huge on the market. And we believe we can take a substantial share of the remaining market because they are not very effective, at least not in the 50% of the patient. The conjugate, I will be very brief on that, it brings a chemotherapy drug to cancer cells, come, goes inside the cell, and then the, the chemotherapy drug is split from the from an exin and then kills the cells. Um, it's also a huge market. It's becoming $10 billion at least for med specialized medicines. And um, we have done several steps into this field uh, of oncology during the last year based on a directed share issue to our main shareholders in December of 2022. Um, so when you see the company, we're moving into clinical trials. We have clinical trial data already. Uh, we are taking a careful step into oncology and we hope to deliver important information during the, this year and next year. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do we have any questions for Anders? I will start us off then. So yeah, you've gone into to cancer now. Cancer mm -hmm. is obviously several different types of diseases. Is there any specific types of cancer or at the moment you're looking broader? Uh, it is, it's, at sort of this starting point, it's kind of broad because when we observe the literature, it, it's, it shows that, that PS, our target, is related to breast cancer, ovarian cancer, uh, lung cancer, um, um, etc. I mean, melanoma is shown that the more in some cancers, it's shown that the more PS the cells have on the outside, the more prone they are to lead to metastases. There's correlations with ovarian cancer. Uh, the most severe the, the patient's situation is, the, the shorter the expected half, uh, uh, lifespan is, the more PS those cells have on the surface. So we think that by blocking PS, either with an exon A5 or an XV itself, or with the conjugate combination type drug, we will be able to inhibit and stop those cells from growing further. So how would you say that the move into cancer have changed the, the prospects of the candidate in, in general? Um, it's, it becomes broader, obviously. I mean, the, 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 the intravenous solution we have could work both in RVO and in cancer as it is right now. Of course, when you do, when you do a, a conjugate, it becomes a new molecule, a new entity, and that's preclinical still. So we have to move on uh, with the standard type of toxicology and product manufacturing, GMP, et cetera. Uh, so it, is, it changes the prospect overall. I mean, we can, an XNA5 and our drug uh, candidate can be conjugated with several different types of anti-cancer medicines. It's not only one. Okay. Uh, it's, it's, it, would, it gives a bit of a sort of a platform thinking to the company. Have you seen interest already in, within the cancer area? Uh, so we, we obviously go to meetings, we talk to big companies, and they, are, have, they have the luxury to say, well, we'd rather wait until you have clinical data, which is you know, what some of you, many of you hear already. Uh, and that's what we're trying to achieve in a smart way. Uh, we're trying to understand which patients would be more uh, recept uh, receptive to uh, this kind of drugs. Do, do, can we have a marker for PS expression uh, in the patients before we try to treat them? Uh, and there's technology that, can, uh, that exists and can be developed. We have a question over here. Uh, about oncology, of course you can create conjugates. Uh, but if you just block PS with annexin 5, would that in itself have a, an effect on the cancer cells? Yes, yes. I was kind of quick on that paper, but there's evidence from, from um, Johns Hopkins as well as Stanford that, that maybe only one day, four days, five days of treatment with annexin is as effective as the existing checkpoint inhibitors. So, so yes, in itself. It, it changes the changes the microenvironment. That's a lot of talk about the microenvironment of the tumor. And it has a, when you block an, uh, PS, uh, since PS signals to five different receptors on T cells and, B uh, T cells and macrophages, you can actually bro block the immune suppressive action of PS. So the, the, these immune cells get a chance to attack the cell. Yes, B only by an excellent A5 itself. Uh, we've been talking a lot about cancer, and uh, the obvious question is then, why did you start with RVO? <laughs> uh, 
Uh, well, I, you know, yeah, the, the history is, is what it is. I mean, in, in, I think it's 2016, the company at the time, I wasn't there, but it was called by researchers in, in CERN in Paris, France, and said that we have this finding in patients with RVO that they have peas on the surface. We can take away the stickiness of these red blood cells uh, in RVO patients ex vivo, uh, so we believe we should work with this. And the, the, the company decided to do that. Uh, and, and moving f forward, I mean, the, the, the Johns Hopkins data came out in 2020. Um, Stanford Patent was there, but, but with more and more evidence coming, this field has been evolving. There's 15 papers talking about the relevance of PS in cancer. And once you start with RVO, and it's, it's a more limited kind of, of uh, disease and work we can ach achieve there uh, as a small company. But cancer is a very big and very busy field, so we we believe that with limited data in the cancer field, we can still attract a partner. I think we need we probably need to get further down the road with the LBO. Thank you.